EtherCAT as a Master Machine Control Tool. My name is Liz Wright and I'm the Marketing Manager for the Motion Control Association. This webinar will be recorded and the link will be sent to you within the next 24 hours. If you have any questions, please submit them in the questions panel of your webinar screen and we will answer them at the end during the Q&A section. Any additional questions will be answered via email after the webinar has concluded. I'd now like to introduce you to our presenter for today's webinar, Matt Clint from Galil Motion Control. Matt Clint joined Galil in 2013 as an applications engineer. Before coming to Galil, he worked as a development engineer in the physics department at UC Davis where he has, was involved in developing hardware and software solutions for experiments in condensed matter and astrophysics. Matt has brought his expertise to Galil and has worked with numerous research institutions on motion control and data collection projects. At Galil, he has worked closely with other applications engineers and R&D on development of Galil's EtherCAT compatible controllers. Matt holds a BS in physics from the University of California at Davis. I'd also like to thank our sponsors of today's webinar. Galil Motion Control. With over 750,000 controllers sold, Galil is a leading manufacturer of motion controllers and PLCs. Since the introduction of the first microprocessor-based motion controller in 1983, Galil has remained one of the industry's leading in innovators. By offering its customers powerful, cost-effective, and easy-to-use motion controllers and PLCs, Galil is committed to be your primary source for any motion control and I.O. application. Galil's unparalleled array of motion controllers and PLCs are backed by superior technical support and can accommodate the most demanding applications with absolute precision. I also would like to thank our other sponsor, Electromate. Electromate is the exclusive Canadian distributor for Galil motion control and specializes in high performance robotic and metrotonic systems including servo and stepper motion solutions, positioning actuators, and robots. Electromate's extensive product selection is backed up by its just-in-time delivery and stocked inventory. Electromate also offers engineering assistance and technical support by their dedicated customer service team. Now I'd like to hand it over to Matt to begin today's presentation. Good morning. Thank you for joining us for EtherCAT as a Master Machine Control Tool presentation. My name is Matt and I'll be presenting today. This presentation will lay out in broad strokes the EtherCAT communication protocol and the types of applications that can benefit most from its use. In addition, I'll introduce the Galil Motion Control DMC 50000 EtherCAT Master and review its capabilities. Afterward, Galil's Vice President of Engineering, Koshal Shah, will join us to answer additional questions. So let's go through the agenda first. <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to tell you a bit about Galil Motion Control, uh, followed by an introduction and overview of EtherCAT communication, and then go over the DMC 50000 EtherCAT Master, summarize, and then we'll start the Q&A. So with that being said, a little bit about Galil. Uh, it was founded in 1983 by Dr. Jacob Tall and Wayne Barron and was the first company to introduce microprocessor-based digital motion controllers. Galil also pioneered the technology for controlling servo motors with only the position feedback, removing the need for a tachometer. Today, Galil offers its fifth generation of motion controllers with a 32-bit risk-based microprocessor combined with Galil's custom ASIC to solve the most demanding motion control applications. As a pioneer in the industry, Galil introduced the first Ethernet-based controllers in 1999 and have shipped over 100,000 motion controllers in the industry that communicates via TCP IP connectivity. Galil has been developing and selling motion and I.O. controllers worldwide for over 30 years and has built an established reputation as a leader in the motion control and automation industry. Our primary goal is to provide customers with the best products, services, and value while providing solutions to customers' needs. Towards that end, we work hard to ensure that our controllers are feature-rich enough to cover most applications' requirements. To a large extent, most customers find that our standard products are more than capable of meeting their application requirements. That being said, we pride ourselves on our ability to work with customers on custom hardware and firmware 
that will meet their specific needs. Our commitment to customer support and education is the driving force behind our applications engineering department. With more than 100 years of collective experience, the application engineers offer expertise in various fields, including electrical, mechanical, mechatronics, computer science, and applied physics. As a collective group, our focus is to work with our OEM customers to offer the most cost-effective solution to their motion control needs. If you cannot find a motion controller or PLC to meet your requirements, then our applications engineers will work you, with you to define and develop a custom product to meet your specifications. Let's move on to communication uh, protocols. Let's start the, the presentation here. Uh, so the benefit of communication protocols uh, in general is that uh, standardization allows cross-platform integration, meaning that any, any vendor that wishes to uh, develop a product has a set of standard of communication protocols that, uh, that it can uh, work with. Mainly keeping it simple, uh, running a serial or Cat5 cable between components is much easier or cheaper than wearing motor power leads, encoders, uh, etc. Modular design, uh, each component is self-contained yet works in con concert with the rest of the components in the network using an agreed upon communication scheme. The modularization means it's easy to replace, uh, easy to expand. Since they're self-contained, uh, one or two cables can be swapped to connect hardware. A wide market open protocols allow any vendor to develop, to develop compatible hardware, giving the customer a broad range of options for their application. Specific to today's presentation, we'll discuss the EtherCAT communication or EtherCAT communication protocol. EtherCAT stands for Ethernet for Control Automation Technology invented by Beckhoff Automation in 2003. The Ethernet-based field bus optimized for industrial automation control, essentially taking Ethernet communication and stripping it down to the bare essentials that's needed for motion control applications. Based on CanOpen, the device profile for embedded systems used in automation. And the standards are defined and maintained by the EtherCAT Technology Group, or ECTG. EtherCAT and Ethernet. EtherCAT is based on the physical layer uh, of Ethernet, but there are fundamental differences that, that distinguish them. Ethernet is designed to move large amounts of data through many nodes. It's able to route data to and from billions of separate addresses, allowing communication across vast networks like the Internet. Large overhead. There is a large overhead associated with Ethernet communication in that it must contain a source address, a destination address, a type, uh, and that is a, that's a lot of processing on each side of the of the transaction. And software handles the extraction and processing of data. EtherCAT, on the other hand, uses standard Ethernet hardware, CAT5 cabling, and network interface cards. It streamlines Ethernet communication at the hardware level. Data processing on slave devices is handled on the fly via FPGA or ASIC, minimizing latency. This is in contrast, as mentioned, to Ethernet, which hand, which, in which software handles the processing. The flip side of that is that initial setup and configuration of the EtherCAT network is required. So let's go over Ethernet frames first as a baseline. An Ethernet frame being sent down the CAT5 cable from a host uh, to another PC uh, consists of an Ethernet header. Uh, this, this is built up of the destination address, so the address of the device that's sending the packet, and the source address, the address to which that packet is being sent. The Ether type is defined as it specifies the type of uh, communication being implemented. Uh, the hex 08 Zero zero specifies IPv4, which is the which is the predominant protocol for internet communications. Ethernet data then follows. Uh, the payload is the particular data that's being transmitted, uh, and can and can consist of up to 46 to 1500 bytes per packet. And the CRC checksum at the end of the frame, which is 
uh, essentially a checksum to check the validity of of the data upon receipt. As you can see in the in the figure below, uh, the majority of the Ethernet uh, packet is going to be the data. EtherCAT frame is very similar to an Ethernet frame. There's a few subtle differences that that accentuate the speed of the protocol. The Ethernet header, uh, EtherType 08A4, specifies EtherCAT specifically. Or the Ethernet header. EtherCAT header uh, includes the data link to tell the slave down the line uh, how much data is going to is going to follow uh, in the packet. Uh, one bit is reserved uh, by the EtherCAT organization for future use. Uh, and then there's the protocol type, uh, four bits, uh, and indicates the the hex one indicates CAN over Ethernet as opposed to the other over EtherCAT as opposed to the other EtherCAT uh, designations. EtherCAT data, similar to Ethernet, can consist of up to 46 to almost 1,500 bytes, but the EtherCAT header does take a small amount of, out of that data. But as we'll see later, EtherCAT data transmission is very efficient and rarely needs that many bytes for transmission. The working counter is a part of the EtherCAT frame when the, when the Ethernet network or EtherCAT network is brought up, each drive that is active on the network will increment this number by one. So essentially it's a head count of how many active drives are on the network. If the master detects that this number changes during operation, an error flag will be set and handled as per the master's routine. Uh, so it is, it is a, a safety uh, implementation built in the background to handle, uh, to make the network more robust. Each drive on the network has a unique address, typically set with, uh, with hardware switches, uh, rotary switches uh, or, or dip switches set on the actual drive. The master-slave configuration with the EtherCAT master sending and requesting data from the slave. Data is, that is not addressed to a particular slave are immediately forwarded along to the network. This is as, as opposed to Ethernet traffic at which at each, at each router at each node, the packet is taken apart, the source and destination address are looked at, and then it is routed to the next to the next node. EtherCAT benefits from a minimal processing time. It can provide cycle rates or cycle update rates of up to 32 kilohertz. Network lay layout and size is limited only by the allowable lengths of Cat5 Ethernet cable, and according to Ethernet communication standards, this can be up to 100 meters in some cases. Another key benefit of EtherCAT communication is increased noise immunity due to the reliance on Ethernet physical components. Uh, Ether, Ethernet is a differential standard or communication standard, uh, which is much more noise immune than twisted pair shielded cables uh, over four encoder uh, or motor, motor command lines. EtherCAT communication analogy. The most the most often used analogy is that of a train. Essentially, the EtherCAT packet heading down the Cat5 cable from the master to the slaves uh, is, a, is a train, a subway. The EtherCAT line picks up and drops off data to analogous to passengers at each station. <clears throat> this analogy does break down when you consider that it requires the train does not stop. Uh, an Ethernet packet is not halted at each drive. It is on the fly processing to increase uh, speed and efficiency of communication. In my opinion, a better analogy is that of a cubicle farm. I think most engineers can relate to that. Each cubicle represents an EtherCAT slave. Each engineer is told where to sit by, the, by an SDO, we'll get to that later, and a hex address. Essentially, the hex address or the, the physical address assigned by uh, hardware switches is where HR tells you to sit. The boss, appropriately, is the EtherCAT master, sending instructions, PDOs, again we'll cover that in a bit, out to the engineers each morning and picking up their work at quitting time or the end of the day. And this happens at a deterministic rate. So each morning on the, you know, on the second, each afternoon at 
at coding time. So every morning, right, your boss comes through without talking to the boss. The boss comes through, puts the your assigned tasks into your inbox. You grab it and without talking to the boss, start executing your tasks dutifully. So starting to stretch the analogy a bit, the PDO which is sent down to you is a work order for the day. An SDO is a priority list you receive before instructions that tell you the order in which to perform the task. So the bottom line is that EtherCAT, although not, not a very effective strategy for the office, it does not, uh, does not encourage any kind of communication, uh, is very efficient for deterministic uh, servo control. EtherCAT network operation modes include the following. Uh, in profile mode, motion profiling is largely left to the slave. Parameters are set on the drive, like acceleration, deceleration, speed, etc. The master simply sends target positions, either target positions, uh, speeds, or torque to the slave, which then does its own math and profiling to make sure it reaches the target in the allotted amount of time. Cyclic mo modes of motion are, are more, more analogous to um, motion control that would be on a single controller. Cyclic mode master sends commands to the slave at a predetermined regular rate or cycle time, providing targets with each iteration, whether that be position, velocity, or torque. In position mode, the slave has PID and motion parameters set on each drive. Motion profiling is handled on each, on each drive. In torque mode, PID parameters are set on the, match, on the master, which then simply sends calculated torque commands based on, the, based on the error measured between the reference position and encoder position on the drive. Velocity, uh, cyclic velocity mode is very similar uh, to position mode, except that instead of sending position profiles, you are sending velocity profiles. In the previous, uh, as relates to the previous analogy, profile mode leaves tasks up to the slave complete. As long as the slave completes its task on, on time, the EtherCAT master is happy. Cyclic mode is micromanaging to the nth degree, uh, dropping in on a regular interval on the EtherCAT network up to 32,000 times a second to tell you what to do and how to do it. Again, as an employee, not a company you would want to work for, but very effective communication for closing the server loop. So let's move on to the properties of both the EtherCAT master and the EtherCAT slave. EtherCAT master can be any software or hardware that's configured to assemble, send, and receive EtherCAT data grants. This is one of the, the strong points of the EtherCAT protocol. Uh, it is an open protocol. Anyone's, anyone is open to implement it. Requires only standard Ethernet physical layer components for communication. The only specialized hardware is purchased inside the drive. In terms of communication with the drives, all that's required is a CAT5 cable as well as a standard network interface card. Cell sites coordination between EtherCAT slaves, writing and receiving data from each slave in EtherCAT frame. Hence the master the master slave layout that there's one, one controller, one program that's controlling the, the network. As pertains to motion control applications, the relevant data sent to the drives are profiling data, so target position, velocity, or torque, I, uh, input, output, setting, and the data requested are position and input status. Uh, in order for the master to calculate where the drive should be at the next cycle update time, it requires knowing where the motor is currently to calculate the error for the PID filtering to act on, as, as well as input status, which can indicate uh, the status of limit switches uh, or uh, other digital or analog I.O. EtherCAT slave uh, is really 
is really where the EtherCAT communication protocol uh, comes into play in the, in the way that it reads and processes for, uh, profiling data. Uh, and then it writes position, input, and drive status for return to the master. Can be configured in multiple modes of mo uh, modes and operation. All slaves, as according to the EtherCAT uh, standard, all slaves contain specific spaces in memory where data can be written. These spaces are called objects. The entire memory space is called the object dictionary. Each object has its own address specified as an index or subindex. For example, the operation mode data from the master is written to the hex 6060 object in the slaves dictionary. Operation mode data uh, corresponds to whether you're in position mode, velocity mode, cyclic torque mode, cyclic position mode. While position commands in the cyclic position mode are written to the hex 607A object. How are these, how is this data sent? Data is sent based on the can open uh, SDO and PDO packet structure. Data is moved along an EtherCAT network using two protocols, SDOs and PDOs. An SDO is known as a service data object. SDOs can be sent at any time, whether the network is, uh, is operating, running a, running a servo system, or before or after during real time operation. However, they do require additional communication overhead in that they contain specific addresses uh, as well as checksums and as well as acknowledgments back to the master. As a result, SDO usage is typically only used for network setup. PDOs, these are the workhorses of the EtherCAT network. PDOs contain the raw operational data with minimal overhead, and thus are used for real-time processes like motion and I.O. control. PDOs can only be used once they're mapped using SDOs. We'll get to mapping a little bit later. Mapping sets up each byte, which byte in each PDO goes to which memory address on the slave. And this is, this is really the, the secret sauce of EtherCAT. Uh, instead of the EtherCAT, the EtherCAT frame coming in, software disassembling the packet uh, and assigning data to each address. The position in the PDO is what of the data in the PDO after SDO setup is what defines where that data goes in terms of which slave as well as what data, whether it be positioning data, uh, IO status, drive status. So just a general summary. Uh, SDO contains a transfer confirmation, which increases the overhead. The benefit is that the master is assured that the data was received uh, and written to the drive. PDO contains no transfer confirmation. It's, it's essentially sent out onto the network. And is it, it's assumed that that data is received and, and read. SDOs are a client server model. Whereas, whereas there's one server logs into the logs into the clients and sends data to them. PDO is a peer-to-peer -peer model where any slave at any time may initialize communication or, or send data down the line. However, in in most servo applications, uh, communication is coordinated by the master. SDOs are typically used only for device configuration and PDO mapping. PDOs are used high priority transfer, small amounts of data. So the, the PDO packet size is kept to a minimum, uh, typically eight bytes or less. The, let's see, can be sent, SDOs can be sent at any time. So whether in uh, initialization mode, configuration mode, or even during real time operation, SDOs can be sent. But again, there is the price of the additional overhead. PDOs can be sent anytime, but they can only be used after configuration using SDOs. As stated previously, SDOs do include a significant communication overhead. PDOs include no additional protocol overhead. 
let's look in a little bit into the EtherCAT slave state machine. If you're familiar with state machines, um, you are this diagram should be should be self-explanatory, but for those of us that are not, um, it essentially a state machine essentially defines which which roles of operation within the drive can be can be passed from one to the other. As you can see, the bottom mode, the operational mode, can only be uh, reached after initializing, putting the drive in pre-operational mode, and safe operational mode. In order, initialization involves uh, using, a, essentially the drive is sitting there, not doing nothing, but sitting there awaiting communication. And as you can see, no user communication is allowed. In the pre-op state, SDOs are used to configure the drive, again, or configure PDOs. Uh, in safe op, SDO and PDO communication is allowed, so it's essentially real-time communication. However, the drive ignores the PDO, so it does not act on it. You can send positioning information, and the drive does not actually move the motor. So this is this is a good uh, mode to use for testing, troubleshooting, and operational mode. Your system is up and running. Motors are servoed, and so uh, machine is running. PDO and SDO communication are allowed. However, as previously stated, SDOs do include that additional overhead, and so are typically not used in real time. EtherCAT slave architecture. As you can see, the master initiates communication, and this is a single slave setup. Master initiates communication over EtherCAT, or over Ethernet line, rather. And this is interpreted by the physical layer, Ethernet physical layer. Those of you familiar with the OSI um, layering network model uh, recognize that phi is the base of a uh, physical, physical model of the network, and that includes uh, network interface cards, Ethernet uh, cables, and the like. After passing through the phi, it is then forward to the EtherCAT slave ASIC. And this is the ASIC, or FPGA, in the slave is really where the speed of EtherCAT comes into play. As mentioned before, as opposed to relying on software to parse and interpret data, the EtherCAT slave ASIC takes the data, the binary data, directly out of the PDO datagram and maps it into the memory object dictionary through the CPU. CPU, which is the higher level on the slave, handles currently computation, higher level processing, you know, digital I.O. setting, uh, profiling, torque limits, all these kind of things. But again, the secret of EtherCAT lies in the EtherCAT slave ASIC. And that is the only hardware that's, specified, that's specifically used for EtherCAT and is included in any, cat, any EtherCAT compatible drive. Simple PDO example. The incoming PDO position data is uh, defined by EtherCAT standard as a 32-bit number. When that PDO uh, comes in to the slave, it is interpreted via the FPGA again and mapped to the EtherCAT defined memory position or position memory object. So this is, in the analogy, this is the boss dropping by the cube, dropping your to-do list in the inbox. So the drive then takes this data and applies it to profiling in, in the current cycle. In addition, the PDO, once received by the drive, is acted upon and then returned to the drive with data profiling drives, such as the encoder's actual position, I.O. status, and drive status. If there's a fault on the drive, it will be returned. An error flag will be set, and that data will be turned to the drive, which then can act upon that error status as defined in the master. PDO exchange, as shown in the diagram, this is an initial so this is the first PDO that will be sent uh, to the slave from the master. This is after SDOs have been set up telling the slave FPGA where to send each byte in the Ethernet, EtherCAT 
uh, datagram. The incoming PDO, labeled at the at the top of the of the diagram, indicates the three pieces of data that are that are necessary to activate a drive. Initially, and these go from right to left. Initially, the control word is sent. The control world control word uh, is analogous to enabling or disabling the drive, so energ energizing the servo or turning it off. Mode of operation indicates the position, uh, either position, velocity, or torque command, depending on whether you are in position, torque, or velocity mode. The outgoing PDO from the slave. Status word is a confirmation of the control word, telling the master that you have set me for position, velocity, or torque mode, and I am still in that mode. It's a safety precaution built in. 6062 is the position demand value, which is when the, when the master comes up, or when the network comes up, the master essentially tells the slave, this is what I want you to define your position at. Define it as zero, define it as 100,000 counts, uh, anything along that order. Mode of operation, again, is a, is a, is a confirmation of, of the, the mode of operation that you're in, as well as including amplifier state. Position actual value is the raw data from the, from the slave, the raw encoder data from the slave, indicating its current, the motor's current position. Digital input status, 60FD, uh, is, is a bit mask number, 32 bit, uh, that, is, that indicates the status of the digital inputs, uh, with uh, one uh, standing in for a digital high, zero standing in for a digital low. Real benefit of EtherCAT lies in the hardware. We have, and we have discussed this uh, before, but it is worth accentuating. Standard Ethernet physical layer components, CAT5 cabling, network interface cards are all that are required on a PC or, or EtherCAT master. Uses FPGAs for fast command processing by slave name. This reduces latency to a minimum, which enables deterministic control uh, at extremely high cycle rates like we've discussed, up to 32 kilohertz. Physical layout of a network. The EtherCAT master is wired through each EtherCAT drive via CAT5. Hardware switches run through each drive, allowing easy daisy chaining of, of drive to drive. These switches are specific to EtherCAT. Ethernet switches are not are not compatible with EtherCAT due to the stripped down nature. Each EtherCAT drive in this example is running in motor and coder. EtherCAT drives are also compatible or specific to either hydraulic actuators or steppers as well. However, because of the EtherCAT standard, the, the, the type of motor is transparent to the EtherCAT master. As you can see in the diagram on the right, Simplified, the master sends data down from slave one or to slave one. Anything that is not addressed to slave one is immediately forward to slave two, so on and so on. At the end of the transaction with slave three, slave three inserts its data in the return packet to the master. So now we've covered the physical layout. I'd like to talk a bit about the DMC 50,000 EtherCAT Master, which has recently, recently been released. It includes all of the features of our flagship DMC 4000 controller, the addition of EtherCAT drive support for up to eight axes in cyclic position mode. Cyclic torque mode is supported on select drives. Contact Galil for that for drive-specific support. We're the only motion controller in the industry with the ability to mix and match local and EtherCAT drives. This is a crucial, crucial component of, our, of this new controller. Easily configurable and designed with compatibility and flexibility in mind. We made the command set 
for enabling an EasyCAT network, extremely simple, allowing previous applications to easily incorporate EasyCAT drives for new applications to be built on them with very minimal uh, application code changes. Multiple drive vendors supported at this time. I'll list those, list those later, but we are actively looking for additional, additional drives. And most importantly, compatible with Galil's entire line of internal servo and staff remote amplifiers for local access. Currently supported I.O. features for, the drive, for each drive, in addition to position and torque mode control, each drive supports forward and reverse limit switches on the drive, home sensor input, and hardware latch slash touch probe. These, uh, these allow remote sensing on the drive, allowing the master controller, in this case the 50,000, to act based on the status of that I.O. These features specifically allow access to DMC 50,000 commands and routines specific to these inputs. Uh, for example, our pound limit switch, automatic subroutine. Anytime the a limit switch on the drive is triggered, this automatic subroutine will fire, allowing you to include any application-specific commands um, you would like. For instance, shut down motors, back off the limit switch, uh, message out to the terminal, uh, message to the PC that a limit switch has been, has been hit. Now, it is important to note that this limit switch routine uh, is not essential to limit switch function. The 50,000 is designed specifically to halt motion at a hardware level uh, when a limit switch is hit. The limit switch routine simply provides additional flexibility. The home sensor input allows access to Galil's uh, homing command routines, find index, find edge uh, for, for finding the home sensor, and the HM command, which is, which is those two rolled together, providing convenient homing routines provides access to the uh, arm latch and report latch, arm latch to bring up to bring up the hardware latch and report latch to uh, return the position at which the hardware latch occurred. The EtherCAT error automatic subroutine, much like the limit switch subroutine, runs immediately upon an EtherCAT, a perceived EtherCAT error. So once a PDO is sent down to the drive, the drive then includes its drive status. There's a specific alarm bit that is set, and the, the drive interprets or, or recognizes this bit and immediately fires the EtherCAT error auto subroutine. This is especially convenient as specific error codes for each drive are not standardized. Uh, the EtherCAT uh, standard has not applied to them. Drive errors include under voltage, over current, uh, encoder errors, a whole whole slew of uh, of potential uh, codes. The EtherCAT error automatic subroutine allows for easy parsing and identification of the drive in order to handle those specific error codes. These are examples of setting up a simple move, a position relative move, on a local axis, where you can see the motor is, is, is energized with the servo, servo here. Command a, a position move, begin motion, and then after motion, set bit one as an indicator to the operator that the move is complete. And then also message out to the PC that it's complete. Now you can see on the bottom right that this code is almost identical with the addition of only three commands. MT10 tells the controller that the A axis is now set for, it's configured for EtherCAT position mode. EX minus 1 is EtherCAT exchange minus 1. Assign the first EtherCAT drive on the line. So the first one physically down the line from the master is now assigned to the A axis. EU1 brings up the EtherCAT network, and now you're ready to go. And as you can see, the code below is identical. So this is really what provides uh, a huge amount of flexibility in the DMC 50,000 in either editing previous existing application code or uh, implementing new applications. 
CMC 50,000 hardware layout. This is kind of the end-all, be-all. Uh, you can see the 50,000. The bottom three drives are Ethercat drives on servo motors. Uh, again, these servo motors, these can be servos, steppers, hydraulic actuators, linear motors, depending on what the Ethercat drive is configured to run. The red lines to servo motors indicate uh, motor or power lines from internal 50,000 am amplifiers. The green lines indicate step and direction signals running to individual stepper drivers, which then run stepper motors. So it really is uh, flexible and configurable for whatever your application requires. And again, this is a, a function that is unique to the 50, to the Galil DMC 50,000. It's a list of compatible Ethernet drives which are, at, th at this point, are all uh, rotary servo motors, uh, motor drives, uh, with incremental encoders. And as mentioned, we are actively looking to include support for additional vendors. We're seeking input from customers. We're really letting, these, this is our standard, uh, standard line, but we are looking from, for customer input, uh, waiting for the market to, to guide uh, where our next, uh, next drives to be supported. Our, our R&D drive support process has become pretty streamlined. In summary, ETCAT protocol is gaining traction, robust and efficient solutions demanding large-scale automation applications. Um, ETHCAT is specifically designed for, as mentioned, large-scale applications. Uh, for small uh, local applications where the controller is in close proximity to the drive. Uh, EtherCAT may not be, uh, not be able to reap the benefits of EtherCAT. Built on the physical and data link layers of Ethernet communication, making the technology more accessible right off the bat. The network engineer is, is familiar with uh, the physical and data link layers being network interface cards and Cat5 cable. There is a higher controller and drive cost associated with Ethercat controls. However, this is easily offset by the use of pre-existing easily attainable hardware. This also reduces uh, maintenance and installation costs. Running a running encoder lines and uh, motor command lines to individual drives over 20 meters is a lot more expensive to install and maintain if in the event of a line being cut, uh, some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, error in the system, it's much easier to replace a Cat5 cable uh, as opposed to troubleshooting and rewiring 8, 9, 10, 12 different lines. And due to the Ethercat communication protocol, networks are easily expandable as we've seen, modifiable and simple to maintain. Uh, since the Ethercat standard specifies where those memory locations we're writing to are. It's, it's simple to change out drives, uh, which are transparent to the masses. So at this point, I'd like to open it up to questions. Uh, our VP of Engineering, Coach Will Shaw, uh, will join us uh, to see, cover any questions you may have about this presentation. All right, thank you, Matt, um, for that information. And we're going to take questions from the audience now. So if you have any questions, you can put it in the panel um, box on the GoToWebinar. Okay. okay. Our first question that we have is, I am already using a Galil Ethernet TCP IP based controller for my sixth access application. Should I consider moving to the EtherCAT based controller? Um, as we previously discussed, whether to move to EtherCAT or not is primarily a question of what the application requires. In situations where the amplifiers and motors are close to the controller, leading to a small footprint, EtherCAT is n really not the best fit. Uh, it's, it's essentially, best, the best fit is in large industrial applications 
long distance wiring, noise immunity. Uh, again, instead of wiring encoders, motor command lines, it's much easier to plug in a Cat5 cable. Cost increase from EtherCAT drives will be justified, though, with saving material cables uh, maintenance associated with a, a centralized solution. Next question. Okay, our next question is, my application uses a combination of electrical and hydraulic servos, as well as two low-power stepper axes. How is this addressed by EtherCAT connectivity? Again, since the EtherCAT standard essentially defines where that profile data is written to, type of motor actuator is transparent to the master. Uh, you can tell the, either the servo to move position, stepper to move to a position, actuator to move to a position. Specifically, the DMC-50000 uh, adds to the flexibility offering by offering simultaneous control of EtherCAT axes as well as local axes, whether they be stepper or servo, and those can include our low-cost internal amplifiers, saving, again, saving costs uh, and maintenance. All right, our next question is, is EtherCAT a uh, deter deterministic or a non-deterministic network, and which is better? Uh, similar to the, the question about whether Ethernet or, or EtherCAT is, uh, is better, it really, it isn't a question of better so much as a question of appropriate to the application. Deterministic versus non-deterministic. Uh, EtherCAT was designed specifically for closing the servo loop over the wire. Um, essentially, as we've seen, closing the servo loop over long distances or through efficient uh, communication. So stripping down the Ethernet packet as well as fast processing by EtherCAT specific um, ICs type of tightly coupled control demands a deterministic network. Using a single motion controller to coordinate communications between all slaves on an EtherCAT network while acting as a gateway to a host PC guarantees deterministic performance as opposed to running a master as a PC where you're dependent on software operating systems. Best to use a dedicated controller. Okay. Do we have any uh, further right. questions? Our, yes, our next question is, how is local and remote I.O. sampled in an EtherCAT distributed control system? Okay. Uh, in the same way that position data is passed between the master and the slave over PDOs, uh, again, allowing or due to that great EtherCAT standard, the I.O. status is, is also stored in specific memory addresses, which then, get, then can be written to the PDO returning from the, slide, from the slave to the master. With the DMC-50000, the controller can provide options to both EtherCAT I.O. as well as Galil's Pocket PLC, the Rio 47000, uh, which also uses uh, Ethernet TCP IP communication. All right, we have one last question. Okay. Are advanced modes of motion, such as uh, helical interpolation, linear and circular interpolation, or contouring mode supported in your EtherCAT master? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, the short answer is absolutely. Uh, one of the driving forces behind the design of the 50,000 was to allow access to our entire set of advanced modes of motion. Basically, if you can do it on a local axis on the controller, you can do it on an EtherCAT axis. So in addition to simple point-to-point -point motion, 50,000 is capable of helical, linear, circular interpolation modes, contour, PVT modes, as well as electronic cam and gearing modes. Additionally, and this is what we consider to be one of the major strengths of our controller, these coordinated moves, or these moves can be coordinated between local axes and EtherCAT axes simultaneously. Essentially, the EtherCAT drive becomes transparent to the master. As far as it's concerned, it's a local axis, which again uh, adds a huge amount of flexibility. All right. Thank you, Matt, for sharing that insightful information with us. Thank you also to everyone who attended the webinar today. 
Finally, thank you again to our sponsors, Galil Motion Control and Electromate. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and an email with a link to the recording will be sent to you in the next 24 hours. All questions submitted through the webinar screen will be answered by email after the conclusion of today's webinar. Be sure to visit www.motioncontrolonline.org for a list of our upcoming webinars. Thank you and have a great day.